Com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. I'm your host, Fahima Mohammed, and your relationship and couples coach. A very, very warm welcome to all of you watching across Facebook or Twitter or even live on Sky Channel 752. I really do uh, appreciate all the support and everybody that's tuning in. And already we're getting messages on WhatsApp, and it's absolutely amazing. I also want to say that I would love to hear some of your comments or questions. And if you do want to call in tonight, speak to myself or my guest, you're more than welcome to join in the conversation. And you can do so by calling in live in the studio on 019-24231-083. And we do have a uh, natural, national rate, uh, that bill that uh, does apply. So please do ask the bill payers permission before you do call in. As well as um, if you want to call in anonymously uh, by sending a message, uh, you can do on WhatsApp, which is a free service, and that's 07585835150. I would love to introduce my guest tonight, who is Sara Malik. Salam alaikum, Sara. Wa alaikum assalam, Fahima. Thank you so much for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure to have you tonight. And what an amazing topic we have as well for everybody that's watching. Is love enough? We talk about relationships all the time and we absolutely adore the fact that when we are feeling that special way with somebody that it will last forever. And obviously we think that, you know, this is it. When we are in love, that love is something that would be cherished and it will solve all our problems in the future, regardless of what we go through, no matter how many years and all the obstacles and the challenges. Is that really true, Sarah? You know, it is something that we do need to discuss because we have so many challenges today and it is a really good foundation, right? You have to feel something and it doesn't always start in that way. And sometimes it does, but this is something that we're going to discuss tonight with Sarah. But before we do, can we ask you, Sarah, to just quickly describe what you do and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you so much. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you, Fahima, on um, Single Muslim Live. And to be discussing this really, really precious topic, is love enough? And um, just to, um, to answer your question, um, I'm a fulfillment and intimacy coach for Muslimas. And I help Muslim women and couples to cultivate love and respect in their relationships, in their lives, so they can be fulfilled and also live a satisfying life, not just in terms of their own lives, but in terms of the relationships that they have, in terms of their vocation, their calling. Um, and yeah, what you said earlier um, was really important, I think, and that is, you know, love is a really important foundation um, and it's often the very first thing that is already there or grows. Um, but how do we keep that going is the, is the burning question for today. Definitely. Um, to be honest, uh, we're getting the messages coming in really quickly and I've got one already. Um, it's probably someone that you know, actually. It's from Um Isa, who's actually said so far on WhatsApp that working with Sarah has been amazing. I started my healing journey with Sarah just under two years ago. It was so much more than the issues I thought needed addressing. Um, the more we dug together, the more I realized how much I needed to address. Sarah is patient, kind, and very warm in a way she deals with difficult conversations. Two years later, I'm a different person. I'm happier and stronger, and I've learned that it's okay to put yourself first. It's not selfish. Yes, things still need working through, but I would 100% recommend anyone having a tough time to pick up the phone and contact Sarah and begin their journey of healing. Thank you so much for that message. It's really heartfelt. And I can hear the caller, um, the person that sent it in as to how deep you have actually made an impact on
that. Um, let's just say there's a couple that has been married, because we do find these cases when it's, you know, beyond six, seven years. Um, there is a change in connection. And do you think that is there's a you know lack of love or is it a different love? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, yeah, that's really, it's really nice how you've said that. And um, it's, um, you know, first of all, thank you so much to Om Isa for writing in. That was really nice. And um, I loved what Om Isa said that, you know, um, you end up, when you work on yourself, you end up addressing so many different issues. Um, and often you think it's a relationship issue or you think it's a communication issue, but often it's quite deeply rooted. Um, and this concept of love is like what you said, you know, there's different, the, different types of love. Um, and the, the types of love um, that we are needed and are present at the beginning of a relationship are very different to the types of love that come afterwards, um, after children, after, you know, the daily grind. And the way that cherished Muslims like to see it is love is a verb. It's something that you do. It's something that you speak. Um, we use the love languages a lot by Gary Chapman in, in the cherished Muslim um, community. And that is looking at how the other person wants to be loved because we all want to be loved in a particular way, right? Um, and that's where the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, said that you will not truly believe until you love one another and you will not uh, truly believe until you love for your brother what you want for yourself. And we want to be loved in our own particular way. So if we love others in the way that they want to be loved, we've got more of a, we've got more of a, it, 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 it provides a beautiful foundation for that love to prosper and flourish. Um, so what you were saying about the different types of love, you know, if we are seeing love as a verb, it's about looking at what we need to do to cultivate that love, even if that's after seven years. And what we also see is that love uh, have seasons. So you've got a, you know, exciting type of love, and then you've got a reflective type of love. You've even got a love which requires distance from one another. Um, and that might be giving yourself love whilst your spouse gives themselves love and just having a bit of separation, knowing that you can come back to that romantic love once again. I love that. I absolutely love what you just said about the different types of love and the way you described it. And I think the important thing is that people realize when people are pulling away at some point, uh, not all of it means that they have a, a lack of love. It just means they need to just sort out their own things. And I think that's such an important takeaway right now from that, you know, the last point that you made, because a lot of us interpret it that, you know, once you love someone, we have to be in their pockets all the time and they have to, you know, spend all of that um, sort of like emotion and sharing emotion and yeah maybe at the beginning it may be okay and normally it's actually even before the marriage <laughs> so um you know when that courting period but when you get married and you settle down and life just happens and you are still an individual um do you think that men and women interpret love and you know show love differently i'm not going into the five languages i'm just talking about general terms do you think that you know men especially in our communities i always find that women complain that you know their spouse do not communicate that it doesn't matter if they know it or not they just don't don't feel it they don't feel it from their partners that they're actually loved is that something that you come across or is that you know not that common what do you think no no it's totally like it's so common and it's so understandable and i think that comes down to um the real the ethos um, behind Cherish Muslima, and that is acknowledging that men and women are different in their own ways, and femininity has been given a really bad rep. Um, it's been given, you know, it's been said to be weak, feeble, um, push, women who are too feminine um, get thought of as being doormats or pushovers. Um, and men often fear the, the strength that comes with masculinity. If they fear, if they use that strength, they're going to be, um, end up being labeled a bully. And if they show their feminine side, then they're going to be labeled as not being strong so when they are perhaps growing up even in their um in, in their youth or going going into early adulthood if they haven't got that permission to be emotional to be loving to see love in their families which often in um asian communities 
is not that is, is not it's not it's not um, openly expressed. If they don't see that and if they don't learn that, then they might find it hard to communicate that. Now that's not to say they're not feeling it inside, because they will probably coming back to the love languages be you know doing acts of service and you know showing physical affection, but the wife might want those words, and it's often the words that they need help with, and that's why coaching is really really effective because it teaches men and women the skills it teaches them the words um, even if they feel uncomfortable to be able to express that what do you think about that I think that's um, absolutely amazing what you just said. And I think you've explained it really nicely. But the thing is, I've got so much questions coming through on WhatsApp right now. I'm going to go through them. So hopefully we can have a few at the side of the break before we get to the next. Um, Okay, so we have one question is anonymous saying that, hello, we'd like to comment on the live show, but uh, about is love enough? And Sarah's book explains the strategies and tactics that guide one to a fulfilling relationship that shows uh, we can build on love. So I guess um, probably explain a little bit to me as to what you've written in your book, which I don't know if we've actually mentioned. What's the name of your book? And it actually does, well, someone's read it saying that it actually explains a lot of the strategies and tactics. And um, can you share some of those things on tonight's show? Yeah, I'd love to, love to. So yeah, coming to the book, um, it's the four traits of a cherished Muslima. Amazing. And the, and the pretext is how it takes more than just love to nourish your marriage. So that's why today's title is really apt. Um, and what we cover in the four traits is, I suppose, when we're looking at the trait of love, we're looking at three particular habits. And the first one is gratitude. The second one is self-care and loving yourself. And the third one is giving love. And so we always start with gratitude in Cherish Muslima. Um, on the- Well, before we go back to uh, those tactics, I just want to uh, say that we are coming up to a short break and we're going to continue with Sarah after this break. But do stay tuned. Please stay with us. This is really exciting. It's going by so quickly, but I have so many questions that is coming through WhatsApp, which I'm going to read out at the other side of the break. And inshallah, we'll see you in a few minutes. Make sure you grab. Welcome to our weekly show, Reminders, live from British Muslim TV. Sinning and then realizing the mistake and asking for true acceptance, Tawbah to Nasuha, is a sign of Iman. Try to help somebody, try to love somebody, try to be of benefit to somebody. Just genuinely, out of love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We care a hundred percent. So our Zuccart policy is a hundred percent. Because just like you, we want every single penny to go to those who need it most. People like Ahmad. Donate Zuccart with Penny Appeal now. Because with us, a hundred percent goes to those who need it most. Penny Appeal. Small change, big difference. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. We are here with Sarah Malik uh, discussing is love enough? And we've got so many messages. I'm going to go straight to it. Actually, there's quite a long one. So please bear with me and hopefully you can answer it in, um, in your own sort of like time and sort of uh, chronologically. So it's a salam to Fahima, to our guest as well today, fulfillment and intimacy coach. Sarah, I do believe love is enough for a long lasting marriage. As human beings, I would say majority Muslims want to be loved and feel as they are good with their partners, inshallah. If they have children, for example, show their children what true love is and what genuine love is, along with being a good parent. Could say love isn't enough in the aspects of the bedroom. For example, a Muslim lady who is waiting for marriage, she could want to try the romantic stuff in the bedroom and want this in her marriage more. Respect, trust and communication are all reasons a marriage would work. 
Very good. Um, thank you so much for that message. I really love it. Well, what's your thoughts on that, Sarah? There's a lot going on there. Yeah, definitely a lot going on there. Thank you so much for sending in that, that comment. Um, and what I would say is I completely get that, that, you know, we need so much love and even with parenting in the bedroom. Um, but I love what you said right at the end. I don't know the exact words, but it was trust and respect and communication. Was that right? Commitments. Um, and, and so, so yeah, I mean, it, it's more than just love. It's also trust. It's also communication. And that is such a big thing yes. in us, on its own. Now, you could love someone to bits, but if you're not communicating that properly or communicating in the way that it's being re um, received in that in the way that you intended and, um, and, and respect, if you're loving but you're not being very respectful, now you could buy flowers, you could buy gifts, but if you're not being respectful to your spouse, um, it, that love might not be received very well um, and and your sweet nothings might fall on deaf ears if the respect isn't there. So I think the combination of everything that you said is really, really beautiful. Um, well, that was the message from the actual, um, uh, you know, the viewer that was watching. So I can't take credit for that. So thank you so much. But we do have another question saying, how, which leads to the next one, actually, from what you were talking about, um, the respect. It's like how to put boundaries without being disrespectful and trying to be firm and fair. I guess that's the reason why a lot of us, um, especially women maybe might feel that if they were trying to set boundaries and um, have a, you know, a particular way that it might come across as disrespectful. Um, how would you answer that? So yeah, so in Cherish Muslima, we really focus on communication and the words that we use, really speaking for ourselves um, and communicating what we want and what we need from the other, if that's your spouse or if it's your other family member. It's so important that we, we make our requests without complaining. Um, and I love what, the, um, what the, um, the, 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 the person who sent the message in wrote about it being firm but fair. So it's mm -hmm. so important that it is fair. The request that we're making is fair. The boundary that we're putting down is fair. What sometimes isn't fair is when you put your boundary down for a particular thing, but then you don't respect your spouse's boundary when they put it down. So it has to be going both ways. So that firmness and that fairness at the end, I think that's the key in your answer. That is very true. It has to be reciprocated. Um, actually, we have another question saying that, how can you evolve in an environment where you are the only one that is being respectful of the other? That's quite mm. a serious one, actually. Yeah. So um, yeah. how would you address that? Yeah, so it is so important for every spouse to communicate their need for respect. Um, mm -hmm. And when you are being respectful and you're not getting it back, it's really, really soul destroying. And it's soul destroying for a lot of ladies that have to um, that experience this. But equally so, it's so soul destroying for the for the for the, for the men who are being respectful and it's not being reciprocated back. At times like this, I really, really advise that person who's not being respected back to really strengthen themselves, whether that's through coaching, through therapy, through speaking to like-minded people. If it's uh, a man, go and seek out your brotherhood, go and seek out a wise uh, male who can help you mm -hmm. if it's a woman you know seek out a sisterhood like cherish muslima um or you know go to a professional that can help you that can help you to role play get the words out um just i was just speaking to somebody this morning actually and um showing her how she could put down her boundary um with a friend of hers uh, who had hurt her um, and, in, and, I, and I was encouraging her to speak for herself and her own feelings. And when we started with the role play, what she said was, um, you know what you did earlier? I thought that was really mean. No, no, she said, you were really mean. <laughs> so I stopped her and I said, look, you're talking about her now and you're talking about something you think of her. You're still not talking about yourself. So it is so important to just have that role play, to get those words out, to practice those words so you can put down 
firm boundaries and, and let the other person know that I'm not okay with being spoken to like this. And I'm not going to continue the conversation if you continue speaking to me like this. So could you please speak to me in a respectful manner? So just those words are so important, but often we don't say them. A classic um, um, example of that would be um, somebody I know who would say all these things and say, but they, they can't treat me like that. They shouldn't be speaking to me like that. And I would say, did you say that? And that person would say, no, but I thought it in my head. <laughs> so it's important to actually get it out and let the other person know. That is really useful uh, tips over there. Thank you so much, Sarah. It is important, actually, that we do speak uh, what we're feeling and you do get what you tolerate. And I know that, again, uh, we are touching on certain aspects which might affect certain people. And if you are having an impact on this, please do remember that we do have a support system here on British Muslim TV. And if you want to reach us, please do get in contact on britishmuslim.tv forward slash support. Thank you so much for uh, sharing all of that so far. But let's look at today's um, generation, today's day and age. Women have changed. They have become more uh, vocal. They have expressions which we never used before. Even our parents look at us thinking, you know, oh, my gosh, you know, you talk so much. And, you know, um, men's roles have changed in the house. Women's roles have changed in the house. So we're not actually that subservient, to be honest. We actually uh, we want love. We want commitment we want we want it all um to some aspects that's really good that we are actually being vocal but other aspects um we kind of even sometimes taking over the male's role and we can do it all <laughs> so how do you see that now in a marriage in today's day and age where women's roles have changed and they have become a lot more empowered um, I'm not saying that, you know, that's a good thing or a bad thing. We're just generalizing here. But I just want to know that, you know, have that um, change in sort of like some of the households? What's your um, thoughts on this, Sarah? Yeah, so this is a massive big question, right? And I think we'd need a full hour to just like brush the surface of this. But definitely men and women's roles have changed so much. And in my view, for the better, um, men are being more respectful. Women are being more self-respected. Um, and that is working well for some people, but for others, it's not working well because of the dynamics and the way it's reciprocated in their in their own uh, small family units. Um, unfortunately, we do have a really big, um, I don't want to say pandemic because of everything that's going on right now, but it's, there's a big rise in society right now of as you said, women being able to do it all. Um, and I refer to the woman who does it all as superwoman. But when Superwoman does it all and she doesn't need anyone else to help her, she will end up burning out because we have taken on so many roles that we're using we're using our adrenaline, we're using our um, cortisol, we're even using our limited levels of testosterone to get us through. And when all of those are depleted, we end up burning out. We end up becoming horrible. We end up um, becoming the martyr. We end up becoming the victim. And it's not serving us. It's not serving our health. And it's not serving our relationships. So women, it is possible for women to be so successful, to be empowered, to be vocal, and to do lots of things. But we have to take it within our stride. We have to do it from a place of nourishing ourselves, looking after ourselves, putting down boundaries, putting down really dignified boundaries, um, and also being able to nurture our relationships as well. And that's actually what the four traits of a cherished Muslim is based on. It's based on these traits which are within us, which often we don't access and tap into, and we just go into overdrive with one trait. For example, all love, or all leadership, or all productivity. But when we just are um, tunnel focused, then we start to fall into um, we start to fall into dis disempowered ways that do not serve us. 
That's absolutely brilliant. I mean, you would definitely drop some amazing uh, points there, actually. And um, it is true that we have to learn that we do need other people and our partners are there and it's a team sort of effort. I think that's what it's yeah. about, regardless of how strong and there are moments that you need support, the other person doesn't and vice versa. And we need to be sort of like having that seesaw and balance it every now and again. We have another question, actually, um, from somebody who is asked, uh, what do you do? when the other person is not willing to accept that they are being disrespectful. I guess that's hit a nerve a lot of people where, you know, unless you're on the same mindset, um, I'm, I'm sure people will understand that, okay, fine, I didn't see myself in this way. But now that, you know, you've been called out and you don't want to accept it, that is quite a tough situation to be in. What would be your advice on that? Well, firstly, I would just really like to appreciate that when we spoke about respect earlier, as um, British Muslim TV, you did put a support link up. Um, and, I, and I think, like, as you just said, it's hit a nerve. And when these nerves are touched and they, they affect us and they hurt us, it's often a sign that we need extra support. I, I'll never forget when um, Prince Harry spoke, about, spoke up about how depressed he got when his mother passed away and how it was taboo for men to really speak about depression. Um, similarly, when we are communicating with our spouses that we are feeling disrespected and it's not acknowledged that often is a sign that we need help we need to either speak to someone we need to get a couple's coach involved somebody who can really speak on our behalf and explain to the other person that their actions are not acceptable to us because the more we so in the olden days, as you were saying, in, t in terms of our parents' generation, so many of our elders just put up with it, put up with it. And that resulted in different things. That resulted in depression. It resu resulted in... That is brilliant, Sarah. And I'm going to have to hold you there until we come back after the break. We've got, again, more messages coming through. And we are definitely on a roll right now. Thank you so much so far for everyone that's messaging. Please do come and continue. I will be uh, saying more of them at the other end of the part of the show. And inshallah, we will see you in a few moments. Please do stay tuned. Zero three thousand eleven eleven eleven. It's the best number in the world. I love this number. Zero three thousand eleven eleven eleven. Or you can go to our website. You know pennyappeal.org. Zero three thousand eleven eleven eleven. Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet's grandfather, proposed to keep the name Muhammad, which means the praised one. The Prophet is a person whose illuminated face is used to draw rain from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is a sanctuary for the orphans and a refuge for the widows. It is your light that we need. I'm in Team Orange. Are you? We're in Team Orange. Are you? Assalamualaikum, welcome. You're watching Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. We're here with Sarah Malik, who is discussing, is love enough to nourish and maintain and sustain your marriage and relationships? And we have um, quite a few questions coming through just in that break. So I guess I'm going to go through straight to it, Sarah. Okay, so let's just start with the first one. Salams, a question to Sarah. Love is a beautiful 
Yet marriages are failing extensively, and along with this mental health is a huge issue in the UK. How do we um, divulge into the sensitive area of men and women with mental health issues who seek marriage or who are in marriages? Who, how can they be coached and is coaching available for this? Oh, that's a very lovely um, question. And I suppose it would need a more of a professional answer than mine. Um, but suffice to say that if you do have a mental health issue or some, you know, the person that does have a mental health issue, it's so important that they get it treated. Because when you try to fix a marriage or work on a marriage or increase the love, but you've actually got some pre-existing conditions that require medication, you might not, you probably won't get the results that you need. So it, so it, is, it, is, it is very possible with the right medication and with the right um, supervision from uh, a medical uh, professional, whether that's a sure. psychiatrist. Brilliant, thank you so much for that, Sarah. We do have a caller online. Salaamu Alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Fahima and Sarah. I want to say, what about in Islam when um, men are looked at as if they're the head of the house and they have the final say and final decision? Sometimes I think that could be... Um, it depends on if someone's a good person, they'll fall out right in the buffet. But sometimes in our religion and culture, it could be like the man thinks that they can bully and think they're the boss of everything. And whatever they say, that they have all choices. I think that's unhealthy. But anyway, that's all. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for that caller and such an amazing, enlightening um, sort of statement there. What's your response to that, Sarah? Yeah, brilliant. And thank you so much for calling in and saying that because that's actually one of the reasons that the four traits of a cherished Muslim was written. Um, and that, and and interestingly, um, I don't actually talk and mention that part in my book and, and that's for a reason um, and I think the main reason is because there is so many different points of view on this of what it means for the, the man to be a leader but alhamdulillah with my teachers and the, te the teachers that I've learned from have really really emphasized the, uh, the point that as you said um, the, the husband is the one who is responsible for his family but with that responsibility comes so much extra responsibility, the responsibility of justice and fairness and listening to everybody and choosing the best outcome for your family. Um, so, so you actively would avoid doing things like bullying and pushing your own agenda. Um, and yeah, everybody's different. Um, and that's where our own intuition will let us know if our, if the husband is being a bully or if he's being unfair and it's so important to address that and to address that as much as possible from a place of love but also from a place of firmness and a place of wisdom letting the husband know that what he is doing is actually not islamic the fact that he is seeing himself as the head of the family but not being a proper leader that's not islamic so i think that really has to be addressed and it also has to be pointed out quite um openly and um, unashamedly. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, lovely response. I love that. It's so true. There's so many definitions. As much as you can be a leader, at the end of the day, it's also taking care. Uh, and that makes a man a lot more of a leader when he has that influence where he's, you know, uh, if he's got people under him, it's a responsibility not just to take charge, but to actually make them safe and secure and comfortable and that is really important we do have another message from sarah from bake school saying salam alaikum fahima and sarah i just want to comment i like how you are explaining the different ways to love and the different types of love and how to respect ourselves mashallah i'm learning so much thank you so much sarah from bake school i really love that comment amazing we do have another um, message as well it's quite long so please do bear with me um i'm going to go through it quickly as much as i can um it says Says that the idea of excess and balance of identifiable, identifiable qualities in the archetypes is a way of self-observation that changes both outlook and actions. For me personally, Sarah's comprehensive course has been broken down into manageable components that work. It has enabled me to examine 
adjust and balance my nurturing qualities so that I can set appropriate boundaries. You're getting some amazing love, Sarah, from people that have read your book and followed your program. That's absolutely amazing. And really thank you for messaging and, you know, calling in as well. I just want to go back to one of the um, sort of questions that I had myself with regards to, um, do you think that in today's day and age that if, even though we are showing love and giving love and we're showing up in a particular way, does it come from a place of, you know, feeling that because we love that person, we don't want to set boundaries because we love that person. We don't want to be firm to upset them because we have love. We think that, you know, we can hold ourselves back and all of a sudden it can play out the way it is. There is that scenario. What again would be your response to that? Oh, so thank you for your question, Fahima, and thank you for Sarah's comment, and thank you for this, uh, this the last comment that was sent in. Um, and I think the last comment that was sent in kind of touches on, Fahima, your question, because in Cherish Muslima, we really focus on archetypal energies, and one of the archetypal energies is love. Um, when we were speaking about the male leader, often what happens is the man is so deep-rooted in his leadership trait that he forgets the love trait. So often a woman is so deep rooted in her love trait that she forgets justice. And um, so just as a summary for everybody, the four traits are leadership, love, justice, and wisdom. So whenever we are excess in any of the archetypal traits, we will become overexpressed. We will go into the shadows of that archetypal energy. And that's where you've got Fahima, your example, where you love someone so much that you don't want to put any boundaries down. That is almost like addicted love. That's spoiling love. It's like the spoiling love of a mother. Um, and that can be very det detrimental. We know this when we see mothers spoiling their children. There has to be a level of discipline. There has to be a level of healthy holding back, even for ourselves. So we don't give too much of ourselves that we lose our own identities. And we don't give too much to the other person so that they get a, fault, a sense of false empowerment. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, your program sounds brilliant. You've only given us a few snippets and already I'm like, you know, lightening up in my head with all the amazingness that you've actually shared with us right now. And I hope people are actually watching, taking notes, actually, because this is really, really, um, really uh, vital and uh, dual stuff, to be honest. It's a gem. Um, when it comes to... Um, our busy lives, like you mentioned at the beginning of the show, you know, we have uh, children that come into our lives. We sometimes feel that we cannot actually give so much of ourselves and we have to sort of like split ourselves between our husband, our children, or our wives and our children and our jobs, things like that. So there's only so much love to go around. Or is there enough love to mm -hmm. sustain and to give everyone at the same time and to show them? And how would we manage and balance this kind of love that we want to fester over, you know, in our families and, and bring it home every night in our busy routines and our <laughs> daily work? Is that even a possibility, Sarah? So uh, I love your enthusiasm, Fahima. And you know, when you were talking about it right at the beginning, I was like, oh, I want to say more. And then we kind of just move on, right? And, and I'm like, yeah. I, I didn't get to see that thing. But actually, the one of the habits, so every single, of, well, all four of the uh, the four traits um, have us have three habits each. And one of the habits of leadership and effective leadership is living a balanced life. It's so important. And that's where I use John Gray's work. Um, John Gray's written a, well, he's the author of Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, but he's written a really good book called How To Get What You Want and Want What You Have. And he talks about love tanks and how you, you have a, 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 a plethora of love tanks and how each one of them needs to be filled. Um, and if anything is, if any of them are depleted, you're going to suffer. And if any of them are overspilling, you're going to suffer. So what you said right at the beginning of today's talk was um, sometimes we can have so much love that actually it's too much. And you get that in the honeymoon period where the husband and wife are so infatuated with one another to do everything together. And then eventually start getting sick of one another and start thinking they've got marriage problems so early on. But actually they're doing too much together. And in the in the Four Traits book, I've actually quoted Khalil Gibran's um, poem, Let There Be Spaces in Your Togetherness. 
Like let there be spaces, do things that are separate, focus on the other areas of your life, focus on your friends, focus on your spirituality, focus on your self care, focus on your career, focus on your extended family, your parents, your siblings, your children. Don't just focus on your relationship um, and do it all from a place of worship. So when you are mm-hmm. going out with your friends, connect it to worship. When you are um, working on your career, connect it to worship. Every single thing you do, do as an act of Ibada. And that's actually the very, very first habit of the well, whole church. I love, I love that so much. And that's really good. And it goes on to the next question that was sent across, actually. And before we get to the break, I hopefully you can answer this and I'll quickly read it out. It says, Sarah, once you did talk about women being uh, obedient in Islam, and I really think that this is a beneficial thing to mention for those looking to get married. Personally, my mother-in-law and my husband would throw around the verse in the Quran that says the righteous women are devoutly obedient and expect all sorts from me and weekend uh my faith until i understood the, the boundaries uh and this was explained to me my star art so um yeah i mean that is something that obviously is quite common that uh we pick and depict certain verses or certain things in the scriptures and then we like you said you know we tunnel vision on it so um that is important would you like to quickly elaborate before we go into a break Yeah, so I'm glad you said quickly elaborate before we go into a break, because this is such a controversial question, right? And and, and alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah for our scholars who have interpreted this in a healthy way. Um, And the way that I have been taught it by my teachers is the the right the righteous women who are obedient is meant has been meant in a context of being obedient to Allah not being Mm. obedient to the husband or the mother-in-law. But there is a lot to be said, and there's a lot of um, value in an obedient wife, as long as she has a fair and just husband. Okay, while you said that, we will leave it there, because that's brilliant how you've just kind of like summed it up in a very short space, and we'll pick it up after the the break. And I just want to say... Um, please do stay tuned with us. This is really important information that Sarah is giving us from her program. And it's an amazing discussion with everyone taking part. And I've still got more messages. I will read them after the break. Please stay tuned. Hi, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My name is Faraz Yusuf. I'm here in Sarakunda in Gambia at the amazing, the beautiful, the really inspiring Mrs. Chow School of Excellence with our, the Penny Appeal Orphan Kind program. This changes the lives of children. It's just amazing. And you can help too. For just 15 pounds a month, 50 pence a day. Go to the website. You know what it is, www.pennyappeal.org or call that amazing number 03011 Welcome to our weekly show, Reminders, live from British Muslim TV. Sinning and then realizing the mistake and asking for true acceptance, Tawbah to Nasuha, is a sign of Iman. Try to help somebody, try to love somebody, try to be of benefit to somebody. Just genuinely, out of love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are approximately 250 million orphans around the world. Now that's four times the size of the entire UK population. As Muslims, we have a duty to respond. That's why we started Orphan Kind. Now we urgently require sponsors for orphan children at our homes and orphanages in Asia, Africa and the Middle East. Just £15 a month will enable us to provide them with a foster mother as well as food, clothing, schooling and complete medical care. That's only 50 pence per day. Just 50p. Log on to our website at pennyappeal.org or call our 24-hour donation hotline for free on 03000 11 11 11. Pennyappeal.org. Small change, big difference.
Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Single Muslim Live on British Muslim TV, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. We're here again, this final part of the show, and it's been absolutely amazing having Sarah with us tonight. She has shared so many wonderful things. And we have another question in the break. I'm going to read that out now. I'm going to go straight to them because they keep coming fast. Um, it says, Assalamu alaikum. If one is looking to get married, how can they lay good boundaries and expectations about what they want? For example, a woman's finances. Okay, you can answer this, but as far as I'm concerned and from what I believe and what I know I've been taught is that if I was married, what's yours is mine and what's mine is mine. So how do you sort of interpret that, Sarah? <laughs> it's very simple for me when it comes to finances. <laughs> <laughs> and Islam, that's what it says in the Islamic text, right? The woman's money is her own and the husband's money is there to provide for the family. Um, and um, actually, this reminds me of the time when I was um, talking to Sheikh Akram Nadwi about this. And it was really interesting because the way he said it was like, I don't know what all the women are complaining about, about the, the man having the responsibility over the family. He goes, it's a really big responsibility. I wish my, my wife had the responsibility of looking after the family and I could just enjoy being looked after, but it's not like that. So he was like, what's the big deal? Um, and he was also talking about money and finances as well. Um, and um, and, and these, these are questions that should be discussed um, and are useful to be discussed, you know, if you're looking to get married. See what your future potential spouse thinks about this matter, Think, see if he's okay with it. What I suggest in The Four Traits of a Cherished Muslim is working out something, um, working out agreements that work for the both of you um, and to see if you're on the same page. Now, ideally, you want to see that you're on the same page before you get married, right? So there's no hidden surprises. However, what often happens, because we're human beings, is sometimes we change our minds after we get married and it can be problematic. But that still needs to be worked on you know, um, and see if it's such a big deal breaker for you if your spouse or your to-be spouse is not on the same wavelength as you. See, you can make any marriage work within reason, with compromise and with flexibility. So I'm trained in neuro-linguistic programming and in NLP we have a presupposition that says the person with the most flexibility has the most control of the situation. The more flexible that you are, the more you will find things working out in your favor um, because you are more accepting of um, unique situations, uh, unique decisions that you make as a unit to, for, to um, form a win-win situation. So that's what you want to be doing. You want to be looking at, okay, are you okay with me keeping my money? Would you expect me to contribute to the bills, to the running of the home and see if you're okay with it? So I always say to couples, Find out what works for you. Have your own unique working balance. Don't look to see what so-and-so is doing. Don't look, look to see what so-and-so advised. See what's wor what works for you as a family. And if it's not working for you as a family, see if you can uh, tweak that to make it work. How does that sound to you, Fahima? I love that. No, it's so true. I think what you said is very, very useful and so beneficial and vital. And we do also have to educate ourselves in knowledge of our rights. We all have our rights, men and women. And it just kind of shows like, you know, we are definitely not oppressed here with kind of rules that are stated in our faith. So again, that is an amazing question. And I love that. Um, the, we have another one, um, Sarah. It's, um, I want to remain anonymous. Yeah, of course, that's fine. And it says, could you please shed some light on single Muslims and why is it becoming almost impossible to find a spouse, especially for over 35s, whether it's men or women. Um, how do you uh, feel? Is that something that is quite because of, you know, today's maybe day and age, the generation, people are getting married a lot later. And even whether it's from previous relationship or even it's their first relationship, we do find a lot of single people from that age group. How is yeah. it on your uh, sort of like experience hearing on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for sending in that question. And um, and I think it is true. 
And I think one of the contributing factors is the breakdown of community, communities. Um, you know, it was said, it was said um, as a, an ancient proverb that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it also takes a village to nurture that child, raise that child and get that child married off. Um, and I was speaking to somebody who arranges matrimonial events um, and they were talking about how our concepts of communities have to start changing because first we thought it was the family, the extended family, um, our local community centre um, where you would have all the, um, you know, the, the Eid bazaars and the Eid millers going on. And that was sufficient. But even now, everybody's kind of dispersing, moving out. And it's so important that we nurture relationships. We nurture friendships. Um, we nurture our relationships with our local scholars so they know who we are. Um, and we expose ourselves and get out of our houses. I love Dawud Wolfsby Ali's uh, Nasheed, the people of the boxes. Don't just become people of the boxes, closing yourself inside your little houses with all your trinkets. Um, get out there, do community work, serve the community. So when the time comes where you need your community, then they can serve you back with these referrals and they know that you're there and they know who you're grown children are that's for parents but i think a lot has to be said for like single muslim and the matrimonial um websites. absolutely i was about to say that i was like you need to jump on these uh new ways of uh finding yeah. your spouse and this is something where everything's collaborated together right now and this is what singlemuslim.com is about um is yeah. to actually find that and it is for marriage purposes so if you're serious and you want to um make sure that you find somebody you don't have to go looking anywhere um you know to several different places and locations it's all under this amazing um application so please do um so you, sign can up can i just add to that so, Absolutely. so go for it I, yeah so so i have coached ladies who have been on um you know a, a website such as single muslim and like you said they the whole intention is marriage but you that's where you need to have boundaries even before you're married because, you know, you do get a lot of time wasters. You get people that are encroaching on your boundaries and that's where you need to have, it's, it's love is just, it's not, love isn't just enough for single Muslim and, and the matrimonial um, apps and websites. We also need the boundaries. We also need wisdom. We need to know um, what the other person is kind of where, where they're going with the relationship so we're not continuously getting hurt because I know lots of people can get hurt um, by their um, expectations not being met with the people that they're talking to online so I think this whole concept of having boundaries and having wisdom and taking control and leadership over your own life is important when you're single as well as when you're married. Absolutely. Uh, we are all in vulnerable situations at some point in time. And when you're entering into a space like this, then you have to have the knowledge and you have to make it very clear and, you know, make sure that, you know, you do have somebody around you who is supportive, who is actually watching what you're doing and whoever you're speaking to, they should know the same too, so that, you know, you can filter the ones that are serious and the ones that are not. And not yeah. to say that you can't get that even offline. There are people that come to you face to face and they still have the same yeah. issues. So it's for everyone, really. We do have another question, actually. Um, let's see how you're going to take this one. Um, <laughs> I'm watching this with my friends today. Alhamdulillah. A friend wants to ask, do you like British white guys? Have you gotten any hate from them? Good experience with them in life. Thanks. <laughs> so <laughs> that is a strange um, sort of like twist to things. But yeah, every question is relevant. And thank you so much for sending all of these questions. I don't think I've had that many questions in a show until today, like with you, <laughs> Sarah. How how can you respond to that? Um, you know, when you define people, when they, you know, obviously talking about their backgrounds and their ethnicity, does it make a difference? What do you think? I think it's so important for us all to respect all cultures. Um, and I think that's where this whole, the concept of respect is so important. And we were talking about earlier about how do we, how do single people find the, the ideal partner when we have that. We don't have such big communities anymore. It's so important that we do welcome in all different um, community, um, all different um, races into our communities. And we do get that a lot, don't we? We get the Pakistani yes. community and they, they don't really welcome anyone who's from the outside um, and they see them as outsiders. They don't really welcome them um, in their 
festivities into their homes and this really has to change because we've embraced everything about multiculturalism for our own selves but we need to do it in a more welcoming and a more compassionate and a real accepting way. And I think lots of prejudices come out, which are really brilliant because they're a mirror for us that look, we still have a prejudice here and we need to overcome that. So I think that's sufficient to say about that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, it's so true. Um, it's, it's very much like, it's not about just saying we need to integrate in our work, but we need to invite people into our communities. We never know what difference that can make. And it will also open up their ideas of who we really are instead of just listening to what is on the media when they can see it for themselves. And majority of people who have actually experienced that have had an amazing uh, sort of, you know, um, a journey with fellow Muslim communities, no matter where they're from. So yes, we do need to be open. We are coming towards the end of the show, and I just want to ask you a final question, plus to also leave your details if anybody wants to get in contact with you, but the importance of making your family work so you can leave a legacy and, you know, for your family, your community and the world. We've only got a couple of minutes, so if you can try and answer that, plus leave your details with us so that whoever's watching, they can be in touch with you. Yeah, I think that's really, really a lovely thing, uh, point to end on. So I think I'll end on that point. So just to say I've had an absolutely fantastic time today with you, Fahima. It's been great. And the interaction from the listeners and the viewers has been really, really beautiful. I really appreciate that. And I just wanted to say as a token of appreciation from Cherish Muslima, if you visit cherishmuslima.com slash British Muslim TV um, and sign up, then there's a free gift waiting for whoever signs up. So that's my way of saying thank you to you guys. And you'll also get some special offers for coaching as well. Um, but more importantly, moving to the legacy, it's so important that we change things. Just this last, um, uh, uh, the last comment that was left about um, single white Muslims or single white men. It's so important that we change the way we're doing things. We were talking about our parents' generation earlier. We are having unique uh, problems. We're having unique, um, we've got unique nuances in every single different family. And if we keep with the old ways, we're not going to change. And if we just take baby steps, uh, what we say in Cherish Muslim is forward is forward, your speed doesn't matter. If we just take baby steps to change things, change things in our communities, on our TV shows, with our friends, um, in our small communities, in our own homes, we're going to be changing communities, we're going to be changing uh, changing town lovely lovely cultures. i love that that's amazing sarah you've left us so many gems and i appreciate everyone who's tuned in thank you so much sarah for being with us tonight and everyone that has interacted and calling in i really really so much appreciate you thank you so much inshallah we'll see you next time and thank you all here from british Muslim. My name is Faraz Yusuf. I'm here in Serekunda in Gambia, the amazing, the beautiful, the really inspiring.